Hi, Desiree and Lex. Hello, I will be serving as a tech moderator for this call. Oh, okay, I was just about to ask you, so <laughs> thank you. Um, I will switch over hosting duties now. Sounds great, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, best of luck. Appreciate it. Desiree, do you know if you've already been made a co-host by any chance? You know what? I am, I'm not sure. Would I have gotten um, some sort of email notification? No, here, I can check for you, no worries. Okay. Um, you have not. I'm gonna go ahead and make you a co-host um, in case you have any media that you wanna share, or if you need to share your screen for a PowerPoint or anything like that, all right? Okay. I know one of the other co-presenters will, I won't be doing that but another person will be doing that. But I suppose if I'm the co-host, I can make her co-host as well. Or yeah, um, I'm gonna, I'm the tech moderator. So I will be sort of adding in everyone and um, any speakers and everything. I'll be giving them co-host um, responsibilities, I guess. And you guys will be able to kind of do your own thing from there okay. as far as any presentation goes or anything like that. Okay, excellent. And you'll just be here basically until we get started. Um, yeah, so I will actually be here for the whole thing because I'll close out the session when it ends and everything, but I'm kind of just here silently observing and making sure everything runs smoothly on the tech side of things. Okay, sounds good to me. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, Lex, actually, I do want to ask you a question. I am... Um, I'm near a highway. Mm -hmm. I'm in a hotel that's near highway. Is the background noise pretty intense or can you still hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly fine. I actually didn't even notice any background noise. So I okay. think that's a good sign, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Have you been giving any other presentations or is this one your first one or? I don't really know how this whole conference works. I'm actually a student of a professor and he asked me to help with this. Oh, that was nice. Really sure. But yeah. Um, well, I haven't, I haven't yet, but I've been attending other panels. This is the first one um, so far that I'm presenting, and then I will be moderating or chairing and um, another one and then discussing on another. So yeah, we sort of just move in and out of roles. Yeah, that's exciting. You you get to experience a bunch of different roles in it and everything. That's so cool. I'm excited for this panel. We kind of got an option of like which ones we wanted to moderate or like be the tech moderators for. And so I was like immediately kind of drawn to this one. I don't know a lot about the topic. So I was like, I feel like this is a good place to start learning. Well, cool. I mean, it's kind of, um, which is why we want it to be a round table. It's kind of um, centered around a set of emergent ideas for us too. So we're hoping to, for this to be kind of conversational with, uh, with the audience members as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully. Oh, that's awesome. I'm excited to listen to this conversation. It seems like it'll be a good one. So you're, so you're actually, you're, you said you're a student of a professor who's like involved in- Yeah, I don't know if you know Dr. Corey Gooding. Oh, I don't know. I don't know Corey, but I do know of Corey. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I'm actually, I'm a student of his and he's my advisor um, at USD. Um, so he's worked with me for five years now it's taken me a little longer to graduate so he's known right. me for a while um but yeah that is just fine I was talking to one of my advisees not too long ago and we're like you know what if there if people can they people graduate in four years whatever but I think that we should like normalize and be okay with folks taking a little longer 
my gosh, there's, there's a lot to learn. There is so much to learn. And I feel like if I was just rushing, I would not be sort of taking full advantage of those opportunities. One second, yeah. I'm going to check if this person is a speaker. Oh, yes, they are. It's All right. Her. Yeah. So yeah, there's no rush. Thank you. I mean, unless, unless there is like, you know, some sort of like financial incentive mm -hmm. um, to getting done quicker, which I get. But if there's not, then taking your time is really nice. Definitely. Yeah. I've been trying to give myself a lot of grace as just as far as my mental health goes. And for me, yeah. that looked like taking some time off, coming back, being enrolled part time, um, that sort of thing. So it's I'm moving at my own pace, but it's honestly for the best. And it's something that I definitely need. Mm -hmm. um, on that note, hi, Tara. Or is it Tara or Tara? I'm sorry. Tara. Tara. OK, hi, I'm Lex. I will be the tech moderator for this call. I'm going to go ahead and add you as a co-host so that you'll be able to share your screen or do any of those functions as you need. Um, so you're now a co-host, just so you know. The other person who's a co-host in the waiting room is Tiffany Caesar. Or co-host? Co co All righty, let's go ahead and add a person in. You look very nice, Tara. Thank you. So do you, Desiree. Yeah, just threw myself down. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh man well here we go hi Tiffany. i am lex i'm gonna be the tech moderator for this meeting i'm gonna go ahead and assign you co-host responsibilities in case you need to share your screen or audio or anything like that all right okay you are officially a co-host as well um i'm gonna assume that the other people in the waiting room are attendees of this conversation. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and wait to let them in until it's the start time officially. And you all give me the green flag that you're ready to go. But I'm excited to listen to this conversation. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Black. Hello. Hey. <laughs> I was really nervous because I couldn't get in. I couldn't um, access the password, but I'm so glad I just realized I could just click the Zoom link. So uh, I'm so glad. If it makes you feel any better, I actually, I missed my earlier session today. I, so I'm in California. I go to USD <laughs> and I didn't realize that all of the times were in Eastern time. Oh. So I was like texting um, Dr. Gooding, who is my professor. And I was like, what's happening? Like, why am I not being let in? What am I doing wrong? And he's like, <laughs> They're all in Eastern time. Your thing was at nine. And I was like, yeah. oh, I'm so sorry. So I almost, I almost missed this so myself. <laughs> <laughs> Tara, yeah, I just, I just saw, I, I have my phone on do not disturb. So I just saw your um, message to us. My bad. I'm glad we're here. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Caesar. You're muted. Yeah, so I just got through teaching class and I felt like, you know, I was gonna have all this time to do stuff and it's just like, did not. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm here hoping that the class I'm sitting in is not going to, um, that there's not another class afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so that I won't be interrupted. So I wanted to show pictures, but I don't have that. I just have a picture of my image. So I think that's the only thing I can show right now, but that's what I have. That is more than enough. You, okay. you don't need to show anything. It's just kind of an option for anyone who feels like it'll help facilitate their conversation or what they're presenting on, but okay. you and your face is more than enough and you look great. So no stress. Okay, awesome. Good. <laughs> that's great. Just like Lex is wonderful. I'm telling you. <laughs> also, really... I'm sorry that my camera's off. I'm actually I'm sitting in a towel right now because this was kind of a last minute call that I popped on. So but I will just kind of sit silently and observe this conversation and any sort of tech issues that come up. Um, I'll try and resolve as quickly as possible. Thank you. Oh, that's cool. Were you all deciding if y'all want to introduce yourselves or? It doesn't matter. Okay. I mean, yeah, whatever. I think good. because I didn't have time to really look at things that I think I'm just, I think that might be the easiest. Okay. You know? So. That's fine. There was something else I wanted to ask. What was that? 
Okay, send you all positive energy and vibes and just <laughs> um, all that. Right back to you. It's gonna be cool. Oh, here's what I was gonna say. I was toying around with the, um, with the Zoom lipstick this morning. Were you? Yeah, and the lighting just, it makes it look so, it's like, it like bouncing on my face. So I said no to the Zoom lipstick, tried on the Zoom eyebrows, and they weren't. <laughs> this does not, let me see actually. Oh, oh, is that, is that better? No, that's not good. Yeah. No. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, okay. Well, you're actually somewhere between light and shadow. Yeah, I know. The light made you like really golden. And this, um, you're in the shadows. Is that too, too much? Or is that a little better? I think that's good. A little how it was before. Like the, the, the more shadow? No, the more light. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, my lighting is weird too. I have these fluorescent lights behind me. Oh. So never presenting accurately. <laughs> Hopefully we have some, I see Tiffany is here, Tiffany, Jean. There are so many other good ones, good panels that are happening during our panel. Hopefully they'll be, we'll have access to those recordings. But yeah, I think we could still more or less go through the, the run of show that um, that you posted, Tiffany. Okay. Just checking in, are you all good for me to admit the participants now or would you like a little bit more time to get everything in order? Are you all set? Sure. Yeah, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and admit everyone. If you guys need anything from me, feel free to send me a chat or talk or whatever, but otherwise I'll just be here quietly. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Guess maybe we can wait like another minute or so to see if folks. Hey, Tweedy, to see if folks um, trickle in. You think we can start? We should start? Yeah, I was just about to say. Mm -hmm. right. Well, welcome everyone to our panel. Um, our panel is Mothering Dead Bodies, Black Maternal Necropolitics. And it's a panel of three. And we have each decided just to introduce ourselves. So I will begin. My name is Dr. Tiffany Caesar. I am currently a Mellon Scholar at the Margaret Walker Center at Jackson State University.
Hey everyone, it's really good to be among all of you. My name is Desiree Molinas. I am an assistant professor of uh, political science and also the coordinator for my institution's Black Studies program. It's a fledgling program. Um, and I am in Birmingham, Alabama, as we speak. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tara Jones, and I am a doctoral candidate at Pacifica Graduate Institute in depth psychology, emphasizing in community, liberation, indigenous, and eco psychologies. And I'm also an employee of the University of California, Santa Barbara, where I coordinate the African Diasporic Cultural Resource Center. Thank you so much. So I will begin just discussing how we kind of came together to write this piece. Um, again, the name of our panel is Mothering Dead Bodies, Black Maternal Necropolitics. And I want to state that this is a paper that will be published in the fall in Meridian's Feminism, Race and Transnationalism. And um, I just wanna just spend some time just talking about the, the beginnings and kind of like how we, how we came to work together. My background as a scholar is in mothering as a political ideology. And I've always wanted to do something concerning um, mothering and, and police brutality. And so I was thinking about um, writing a piece on how does police brutality particularly impact Black mothers. And I, I am currently a part of a, a phenomenal um, writing group called In For, In For Us. And I would like to shout out Dr. Tiffany willoughby Hurard, who um, was very um, critical in getting getting us together. So um, we are collectively, as we are writing or publishing this article, we also meet weekly and write together. So I was um, meeting with um, Dr. Malonis weekly at one point, And I was telling her like, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, doing this particular piece and I'm, I'm thinking about this particular ideal of mothering dead bodies. Like what, what are we, what are the experiences particularly of, of black mothers um, who go through this particular phase in which they um, lose a child due to police brutality, not only lose a child, but go through these particular phases in which they have to learn to live again and then become activists, right? As, as they are going through their, their mourning stages, um, they also find this particular strength to fight for the legacy of their, their child, but not only the legacy of their child, but also the legacy of others. And so I was very much so interesting in in creating um, theories and narratives that further uh, explain um, this particular ideal of what, what happens to, to mothers particularly when they are um, under this particular stress and I would say oppression and are targeted when their child um, dies um, due to police brutality. And so I asked um, Dr. Malone if, if it was something that she would be interested in because through her, I was learning about necropolitics. And I, I said to myself, like this particular theory will, will work very much so in describing what these mothers are going through. And then she said, hey, we need to bring, I'm gonna say Dr. Atley, Tara involved because of her, her particular background in psychology. And from there, we had created a team of writers who 
um, whole goal was to really explore this particular ideal of mothering dead bodies and black, um, black necro, black maternal um, necropolitics. Um, I'm going to share an image that I also drew that really kind of uh, express kind of like my ideal of, of writing this piece. And then I'm going to share briefly about the two women that we um, share. We particularly share their, um, their narrative. So if you just give me a moment to, to share my screen. Um, let me make sure that this is, this is up. Okay. Um, all right. I always feel like I should like tell people in advance, please don't judge my screen because I always have stuff. <laughs> I always have stuff everywhere and I just want to enlarge it. Can I? Okay, so when I, as a writer, I, I, I merge um, art into my, my writing and I've, um, I also use art as a form of brainstorming. So when I was thinking about this piece, um, this was one of the pieces that I, I drew. And I was thinking about this idea of blood nourishing the roots because it is the blood of their child that kind of gives them, give these mothers the strength to, I would say, launch into these forms of advocacy, right? And so um, if you look up, you will see um, the names of the organization that these two women that we focus on in the piece. Um, we have Melissa McKinney's, her organization is called Justice for Donye. Um, then we have um, Yolanda McNair organization, which is protect our stolen, um, protect our stolen treasures. And then on the face, I say, you see flourishing tree leaves because for me, there's something in the blood, right? There's something in the blood um, that shed that also provides life. And this is a particular ideal that we are, I guess you can say, um, working with um, throughout the paper. And so now I just would like to provide just a little bit of, of, of the background. And I, I do wanna emphasize this idea that our goal was not to add to this, add, add to like a negative narrative of, or to romanticize mother's trauma. You know, that, that was not our goal. Our goal was to provide an additional narrative to the extensive narratives that already exist on mother's experiences who, um, experience the death of a child due to police brutality. So I'm just going to pull up my, um, can you all still see me? Okay. Um, so I just wanna just share the narrative a little bit of, of the two women that we, we look at. So I work aim to eliminate this, illuminate the stories of two Black mothers, Melissa McKinney's and Yolanda McNair, and those of their children whose lives were claimed by unconventional forms of anti-Black violence expressed through police brutality. On October 17, 2018, McKinney's 24-year-old son, Donye Jones, was found hanging from a tree in her backyard in Ferguson, Missouri. While his death was later ruled a suicide, McKinney's and others maintained that her son was lynched. Six years earlier in Detroit, Adesha Miller McNair, 24-year-old daughter was killed by an off-duty officer while attending a fish fry on a day just shy of her 25th birthday. 
Her death was ruled an accident, which resulted in the officers not being charged and held to account. In both instances in the period following Daye and Adesha's death, the mothers engaged in campaigns to seek justice against police brutality and racialized violence. So just this particular, um, if you would say pattern, right, of how through this particular, these particular traumatic experience, right, the most most traumatic experience anyone can ever go through is losing a loved one like a child. We wanted to figure out how were they able to emerge from such a dark place into creating organizations that provide light for not only their situation, for others. And so these are some of the things that we, um, we talk about in our, our particular paper. And when I was thinking about this particular title of mothering dead bodies, it, it was not coming from um, a place of negativity, but also thinking of spiritual practice, right? And when we think of, of ancient African practices on how the living and dead are walking in the same space. And in this particular instance that even though these mothers may have physically, right, lost a, a child, they're still mothering their children's legacies. They're still mothering um, their, their children's dream. Their, their, their spirit, the spirit of their children are still fueling their activism. So I will stop there and um, pass it on to Dr. Malonis. Thank you, Dr. Caesar. And this, that, that's a, a good moment for me to, um, to enter into the discussion. These concepts are, are emergent, the notion of at least as we've defined them, mothering dead bodies and black maternal necropolitics. And so what I'm going to do is just take a little bit of time to um, lay out how we conceive of them and they're still sort of open-ended. And so hopefully if there's time at the end, we can be in conversation too with you all around how it is you might um, interpret what these terms mean and perhaps maybe even apply it to um, your own research or way of um, viewing the world. So just uh, a bit of concept clarification. Um, so for us, we're thinking, like Dr. Caesar said, we think about mothering dead bodies um, in a multi-layered, a multi-varied sense. Um, we think of it as the, the, kind, the work, the mothering that happens, that transpires along multiple scales and temporalities and even dimensions. So there are, at least in our conceptualizing of it in our paper, there are four sort of layers to this. The first of which is in the more concrete sense, um, or this is how we're applying it in a more concrete sense. It's meant to capture the process or the processes of coming to terms with what it means to mother in the aftermath of having lost one's child. Um, in particular due to police brutality or other forms of anti-Black violence. Um, and in such an instance, uh, a mother, I mean, to be clear, just as a, a sidebar for a moment, we are thinking about mother in a really capacious sense. So not only in the biological sense or um, individuals who mother by way of adoption, but also other mothers. And so I just want to, to, to bracket that. But in such an instance, um, a, a mother who has um, lost their, their child broadly conceived once again, they might um, contemplate, what does it mean? Can I inhabit this identity of a mother when um, feeling bereft of the, the very being or beings who have
Um, so can you all hear me? Can you just, yes. Um, so we, I do notice that Desiree has paused for a moment and um, I'm just going to uh, ask if it will be okay if, uh, if Tara, if, if Tara, if you can kind of talk about your, your part. And then when um, Dr. Malone has come back, we will have her continue. So thank you all so much for, oh, okay. I'm, okay. I'm back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, unstable connection. Um, hopefully it holds out, my goodness. Well, I better move on in case um, it happens again. But anyways, the second is once again, um, a, a mothering practice enacted within context in which the inevitability of black death um, is presumed. And so that is thinking about the relationship between death and blackness um, in a teleological sense, that is then being sort of coextensive with one another. Um, and in fact, Audrey Lord and her work reminds us of this and someone in an earlier chat brought up this line of hers. Um, she says, um, that to survive in this mouth of a dragon we call America, uh, we have to learn this first and most vital lesson that we were not meant to survive. And so mothering dead bodies is a mothering that occurs with that sort of in the background. And with that in mind, it does, it can take multiple forms, right? From, you know, mothers having with their children or parents in general having with their children, um, what in Black and other ethnic communities is generally known as the talk, which is when, you know, mothers, parents bring into focus how the world is uniquely perilous for Black people and give them instruction for how to navigate the world um, uh, with the intent of surviving, right, with that being the aim, um, or it could look like advocating for children in the educational context. Um, so that their children are not held back grades. It looks like going squaring off, say for instance, with um, town and city officials to ensure that um, black people have access, their children have access to clean and um, you know, not uh, water that is not saturated with lead. And so these are just the ways that um, uh, mothers or mothering within this context um, gets enacted. A third way is, um, or the third way we're thinking about mothering dead bodies is that, and this is something that Tiffany alluded to, um, it involves um, the ways that mothers invoke the memories and lives of their children uh, to create new forms of life and to, to generate, to think about different ways of relating to one another. And so in this sense, mothers invest in deeds and in words that allow the spirit of their children to live on. We might say that it's, they allow them to be the current that powers the creation of a, a new world and one in which the sanctity and dignity of black life is accepted as a truth, as truth. And the fourth way we're thinking about mothering dead bodies is um, that it involves or refers to the labor, the work necessary for, um, necessary to nurture and restore and heal the Black woman, the Black mother herself, um, a mother whose children's murders exact collateral damage on them in a myriad of ways. And so we know that anti-Black violence, that its effects that radiates outward, and it, we might even say that it metastasizes almost immediately in what it does to inject harm in and against um, those who are closest to um, the victims, the children, um, including among those are the black, the black mothers. And so it is in this sense that mothering dead bodies refers to the care enacted to ensure that um, anti-black violence doesn't claim yet a, another victim. That is to say that it reduces the potential for the, the emergence of these fears, fears of injury to continue to reproduce themselves. Um, and as, as in a really important side, um, we do understand, and this is something sort of that um, Dr. Caesar had mentioned earlier, but I think it's, it's worth, it bears repeating, and that is we do understand the sort of paradoxical illusions inherent in the term mothering dead bodies, and it might conjure just a sort of 
um, you know, set of macabre images. Um, but that's not what we have in mind. Um, mothering dead bodies, by our definition, involves struggling against the forces that produce um, and consign Black people to spaces of death. And so in that sense, it's about producing life. Um, but one such force that we've identified or is what we are calling Black maternal necropolitics. And without going into a really long um, discussion of what that is, suffice it to say that Black maternal necropolitics is um, the necropolitical force that is inherently um, aimed at controlling the reproduction of Black women um, so as to inhibit the possibility that they might extend life forward into the future. And here, once again, we're not just thinking about carrying life forward into the future um, in just a purely biological sense, but we're thinking about the reproduction of ideas, the reproduction of knowledge. Also, um, we're thinking about the forces that would impinge on the woman's capacity um, to administer, to minister to her own well-being so she can extend her life forward into the future. Um, so ultimately, uh, we're sort of foregrounding the way that maternal activism um, is deployed in a way to mobilize the grief that would then um, that militate against these forces that inspire death in the ways that I've just laid out. Um, so I will I will stop there and pass the baton to my colleague, Tara Jones. Thank you, Dr. Malonis. And um, so we also, uh, in this article, write about Black maternal necropolitics and the maternal activism that ensues uh, from those unfortunate circumstances uh, through the lenses of um, archetypal grief. And uh, what comes to mind is Dr. Fanny Brewster, Jungian analyst, an African-American woman, um, death psychologist, who writes about the intergenerational legacy of um, Black mothers' archetypal grief. Um, and as we talk about what archetypal grief looks like in a mothering context, uh, we can think about images of the Black Madonna throughout various cultures, um, African, European, and beyond. Uh, we can think about the uh, Vudun uh, deity, Urzuli Freda, uh, uh, who was also represented in Christian iconography as the Mater Dolorosa or the Sorrowful Mother. Um, and then also thinking about the lyrics of uh, Julie Dexter, Jamaican and British soul singer, you ain't never heard a woman cry until you heard her grieve for the loss of a child. You ain't never seen pain till you seen that woman with her face tear stained. And so we really drew um, quite a bit on depth psychology in terms of um, looking at this archetypal grief as it related to the 400 years of enslavement of um, and subjugation of Africans uh, across the diaspora and what this has meant for um, the identity of the black mother as she seeks to mother as they seek to mother uh, in this necropolitical context. And we also drew upon the metaphors of trees that uh, Dr. Caesar uh, demonstrated through her drawing that really inspired this discourse. Um, but we think of, uh, we used uh, the parables from Wangari Mathe's trees written by Wule Soyinka. Um, to really um, think about the relationships between human beings as trees. I mean, we think of our family, we use the language of family trees to describe our lineage. Um, and then also he writes that no different from a tree, uh, open to being scarred, abused, amputated, and cut down at will, uh, just among other uh, owned utilities, that this is a condition that we as uh, people of Afro-diasporic uh, ancestry find ourselves uh, very much like those trees being felled uh, unjustly by uh, law enforcement and other agents uh, who purvey this black, um, black necropolitics. And so in the section from grief to activism, transmuting sacrilege into sacrament, uh, we talk about the history, the long history of uh, mothered centered matrix 
uh, which was the paradigm through which Black mothers uh, traditionally, uh, prior to colonialism, uh, conceived of maternal values um, that have allowed them to persist in this mothering role, despite the necropolitical forces that uh, seek to consume them and also their children. And we also discuss uh, Black mothering in the context of colonialism, uh, citing Jennifer Nash, uh, who describes colonialism as a cultural moment rather than a permanent existential condition wherein Black mothers uh, strive to do the mothering work uh, through, uh, through duress. Um, and so uh, we also draw upon the works of Paula Giddings um, in our attempt to understand how Black mothers forged bonds with their children throughout the historic circumstances of their enslavement and subjugation that sought to create a rupture uh, in the Black family by separating mother and child. Um, and also quoting Nash, who describes um, Black mothering as a site of loss and ambivalence, and then also as a site of intense spiritual and political meaning, a space where the self of the Black mother was powerfully remade through the sacred bond between mother and child. And so then we're reminded of the words of the uh, poet and philosopher Khalil Gibran, who reminds us that your children are not your own. They come through you, but not from you. And so this idea that uh, Black mothers have not been had the opportunity uh, to ensure their children's survival uh, but yet they continue to forge bonds of love and care. And uh, they continue to mother in different formations, even when the life of that child has been unjustly taken. And so we ask the question, how do Black revolutionary mothers arise transformed and empowered from grief as maternal activists in service to their children's existence? And in order to answer that question, we work with the theories of Edouard Glissant uh, Martinican poet and philosopher, uh, and using his metaphor of the boat, uh, the, the slave ship, uh, and the language of the abyss, um, uh, evoking uh, imagery of depth, and this idea um, of Black diasporic mothers finding themselves in the same boat uh, of necropolitics. Uh, and so um, to cite uh, Anthrop Black anthropologist Dana Ann Davis, uh, she says that mother, Black motherhood cannot escape being a site of political struggle and animated by emotional labor of pain and terror. And so we, we theorize that Black mothers find themselves plunged into the depths of suffering, into this abyss through loss and the ensuing grief and mourning that uh, takes place. And we ask the question, uh, why go on? And in order for us to answer this question, we return to the middle passage in order to understand the alchemical process that occurred within the African psyche that allowed Africans to endure uh, being in the belly of that boat. Um, and so we discuss the idea of the abyss, uh, Glissant's abyss as sort of a hell or an underworld or to uh, invoke Jordan Peele's um, language in, in the film, Get Out, uh, a sunken place, right? A, a place of, of fa having fallen into a descent uh, of which there is no way out. And so uh, we think of these, this abyss or these abysses in terms of the language of enclosures uh, articulated by uh, anthropologist Damien Sejoyner, uh, which uh, includes schools, prisons, or any um, construct meant to confine and uh, essentially uh, render black life uh, null and ineffective. Uh, and we think of Lassant's idea of the abyss as a place where um, Black hopes and dreams are foreclosed and traditional modes of being have to be forsaken 
um, and unforeseen ways pursued uh, because what is past is, is lost and cannot fully be uh, uh, reconstituted. And so we talk about maternal grief and mourning um, in terms of this idea of black mothers finding themselves in a pit of despair uh, and, and really uh, susceptible to um, this, the sequelae uh, that that mourning produces in terms of uh, the slow death that mothers may experience uh, when their hands are tied, when they can do nothing to bring back that life that they have uh, invested their entire being in. However, uh, what redeems this, this uh, Black mothers when they find themselves in the abyss is again thinking of the abyss uh, as Glissant describes, not necessarily as the end, but as a womb abyss, a place of rebirth and new beginnings. And so Glissant writes that the boat is a womb, a womb abyss. It generates the clamor of our protests. It also produces the coming unanimity. Although you are alone in this suffering, you share in the unknown with others whom you have yet to know. This boat pregnant with as many dead as living under the sentence of death. So this boat is most definitely, definitely a place uh, where this discourse on necropolitics would apply uh, in that it is a boat that carries those who are presumed dead even while they are still living and breathing. Um, and so we reimagine the descent into archetypal grief as this womb abyss, a portal of new beginnings, and also a place where new relations with the, the, the self of the mother and also with the world are formed and the womb as an, as an amniotic space, as a place um, of death and rebirth, a baptism of sorts uh, into the identities that mothers who survived this grief uh, assume, which in the case of the mothers we interviewed uh, is, is the identity of the activist mother. And so as Davis reminds us, we constantly carry deceased children while simultaneously negotiating imagined futures. And so we, we understand uh, through the stories of in the interviews of the mothers uh, we, who shared their stories with us that the black mother's griefs are not only about the death of the children, although that in itself uh, is the source of grief, but it also extends um, beyond the death into the, the, the insult that is added to the injury um, that is uh, characterized by the spectacle that is often made of their children and the desecration of their characters. Uh, in the case, for example, of, uh, of Trayvon Martin, uh, whose assumed use of marijuana somehow justifies his um, killing. And so the activism of these mothers, as we understand it, uh, is not all, it's, it does not have the capacity to bring back the life, but it is a very important part of their healing journey uh, in that they demonstrate their survivor mission, uh, what gives them reason to live after they have lost um, the basis for their life's work um, through the defense of their children's good name and through their legacies. And so here we also invoke the words, the maternal elegy of Bob Marley and the Wailers in the song Johnny Was, where Bob sings, Johnny was a good man. He never did a thing wrong. And so we think about what it means for the Black mother, as Glissant says, to live relation and to clear the way for it. And, and really picking apart the language of the term relation. Uh, we think of the mother's survival work as that of relaying, of retelling, and also remembering, bringing back together that which was uh, rent asunder through this black maternal necropolitics um, uh, to address the issue of the malignment of the children's character and um, and also blaming them for their own death. Uh, these mothers uh, seek to, to restore 
and to retell the truth of who their children really was and that that is a really critical part of their survival work. And so um, in that sense, as Glissant says, right, Black mothers' cries, their mourning is actually, quote, transfigured into the speech of the world as they become spokespeople who challenge Black maternal necropolitics through their activism. And then finally, uh, Wule Soyinka asks us the question, what becomes our duty whenever one or more of us are unjustly felled? Here again, invoking the metaphor of the tree. Uh, and so I would argue, or we argue that Black mothers make it their survivor duty um, to proclaim the truth of who their children were and who they continue to be uh, in the spirit, even if they are no longer embodied. And also Soyinka asks, reminds us, uh, which is very important uh, in our discourse, that unlike trees, however, the felling of the human is only a trick of absence that leaves no void. Tree or poem, the product of mind and will remain. And so uh, we do, um, we do apply an African-centered idea of what life and death actually means in the context of uh, mothering dead bodies. And we understand that these mothers come out of the abyss of maternal grief and suffering, uh, th not, not through an easy process, but um, through this pain and suffering, they harness uh, the energy of the love that they held for this for their children and the love that their children had for them. And through their persistence, through the suffering uh, and through their willingness to go into uh, this hermeneutic process of, of going into the underworld um, and redefining themselves and their relation to life, to living and also to the dead. Um, they're able to transmute the energy of necropolitics uh, in order to advocate for the survival of the whole uh, race. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, um, I just want to uh, just jump in and just add to the discussion um, before we um, open it up for answer questions um, and, and talk a little bit more about the our process of working together. I did want to say that our work is also rooted in Black maternal activism literature as well as revolutionary mothering literature. Um, the scholars have already mentioned the works of um, Patricia Nash. Uh, we also use Dr. Tiffany um, Willoughby Harrard um, works. We, we use revolutionary mothering love on the front lines um, and their particular ideals surrounding revolutionary mothering. Because again, as we all stated, we are not coming from um, a, a deficit. We're not coming from a space of, of negativity. We are really trying to provide um, another way of viewing this that in our our hope is to, you know, inspire and encourage. Um, and I just would like to, to share what revolutionary mothering is. Um, uh, revolution, revolutionary mothering um, includes creating, nurturing, affirming, and supporting life. So in our, in our paper, we, we discuss how these women and why it's important um, for them to do these particular things. Um, revolutionary mothering is inclusive of gifting one's talents, ideals, intellect, and creativity to the universe without recomp recompense. The imperative to build bridges that allow us to relate across uh, barriers. Revolutionary mothering is a form of radical, it's a radical point of view that leads to considering survival as a form of self-love, survival as a form of self-love, and as a service and gift to others whose lives will be diminished without us, right? And, and um, also this idea that uh, we see mothering as encompassing a range of actions and embodiments that extend beyond nurturing children in the conventional sense including fostering Black freedom movements, right? As these uh, mothers intersect in 
um, movements such as Black Lives Matter, right, um, due to their um, the death of their children. And I would just like to share a few of their words um, um, just to, to end um, this part. We, and again, I, we did not mention earlier, but we received permission from both, uh, both um, Yolanda and M Melissa. Uh, we had permission from, from both of them to use their words and they were very much so um, a part of the process. Um, and so um, at the end of our article, we, we asked them, what is sacrifice when a black woman decides to become an activist or a politician using their pain as a platform for change? And Yolanda McNair stated, the first thing that is sac sacrificed is privacy because all of your other children become open to the public as well as the victim's children, your spouse as well. There is judgment on whether or not you've been a good person you lose your ability to be an individual and you're judged by what other activists do or don't do. For example, there are a few mothers that are activists and due to their inability to cope with pain, they turn to alcohol and they are drunk in public and outsiders judge all of us based on their behavior and feel that we are all alike. We all have our own way of handling our pain and grief when it comes to public scrutiny that they choose the worst. Uh, Melissa McKinney state, our time and safety, we sacrifice our family. Most of the time we know it's a sacrifice, but we just do it. We do what needs to be done. And then on the flip side, we ask them how, how do they maintain hope? And Yolanda McNair said, I remember who my daughter was and that she loved life and I have to honor her legacy. Number one, I work to obtain her justice. And number two, I work to influence the system for others. That's how I maintain hope. And Melissa McKinney stated, it's a hard question because what is going on and what has transpired, the only thing that maintains hope with me is my children that are left and my grandchildren. That is the reason why I still fight because it's hard to even think about it happening to another child or another one's baby. Even if I'm not saving mine, if, if I can at least save one, I have hope, but it's difficult. So we wanted to make sure, you know, that we provided that balance, that we wasn't romanticizing this idea that they were creating these organizations, right? But also acknowledging the fact that they are choosing they're choosing a revolutionary act, right? By engaging politically to fight um, for the legacy of their child and children. So um, I did wanted to uh, open it up for, uh, uh, I'm gonna say Dr. Jones and uh, Dr. Malonis to share anything else um, before we open the questions. Uh, we wanted to, um, I did wanna just mention from my point that we, uh, we met weekly <laughs> or every um, weekly to kind of work together um, on the paper. And um, we, we, we had healthy debate you know, concerning the topic. We still have healthy debate, right? Concerning um, how we view mothering dead bodies and black maternal necropolitics, right? Um, I think for me, one of the things I learned in this space of working with other um, beautiful Black women scholars is um, how to share, right? How to let go and, and, and let a piece breathe collectively. In the Western sense, we are taught to, to be very, um, I guess, possessive, right? <laughs> of our scholarship. But when you work with others, you have to learn to share and, and, uh, and allow a space to grow, allow a piece to grow into itself. And that was a really um, great um, space to be in to learn how to work well with others concerning mothering dead bodies and Black, black maternal necropolitics. So um, Dr. Jones and Dr. Malonis, did you all want to add to your experience <laughs> and something you learned from working on this article. Uh, 
I guess in the interest of time, I would be more inclined to make room for the questions. Um, I don't know how others feel about that. So I would like to say, um, if anybody have any comment and or question, I did want to mention that we want to expand the project and make it an edited volume in which we will solicit um, articles from other people who would like to um, talk about police brutality and Black maternity. Um, so we are very much so open to comments, suggestions, um, and response concerning some of the things that we discussed. And just a, a quick note, I want to apologize. I'm having the worst luck with my internet today. And it's, I, I, I'm very much in love with this project. <laughs> and so I hope that my And I, I would just like to say, if you would like to say something, just please feel free to just unmute yourself and um, just speak freely. So are we taking questions now? Yes, we're taking questions and comments, yes. Awesome. And, you know, um, if there's no question or comments like immediately, Dr. Jones, I believe you can, you can go ahead and just share your experience of, you know, working with us and something that you learned about this particular process. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, this was a very new experience to co-author um, and to work very closely with, uh, with scholars outside of the field of depth psychology. And so I would just say that I entered into the process uh, pretty open um, and curious to see how our worlds would overlap and create a coherent um, piece. And what I learned, uh, I guess, with my depth orientation um, is really the importance of trusting the process and understanding that bodies of works have lives of their own and souls of their own. And so in a sense, uh, we were all mothering um, this, this paper together. Uh, and there was a very unknown aspect, how it would come together, what, what, what would the child look like, what attributes uh, would it have of the, the different parents involved. Um, but what I discovered um, was I experienced a very natural process of ideas coming to me um, through dream images at times, um, through um, connecting metaphors, like really ex uh, sitting with the metaphor of the tree and allowing that to expand and also to discover um, sort of the message of the tree through songs, through um, scholarship, um, and, and just through being in nature and observation. And so I would say that while there were very intentional, there was very intentional research that went into mothering this paper, um, that there was an aspect of it that none of us could really um, give shape to or form ourselves. And so it was just through the organic process of thinking together and caring together as people who identify as mothers um, in different contexts um, that gave life to um, a coherent paper that we um, trust also speaks to the experience of the mothers um, who informed this work. Dr. Malone, as we're just sharing just final comments. Um, and then also if anybody wanted to um, share comments or question, please feel free to just unmute yourself.
Dr. Malone, is if you want to just share about your experience of, of working um, in the group and some of the things that you may have learned about the process. Sure. Um, briefly, I think I would say that it taught me um, working with you all and receiving caring feedback around the process. Um, it did teach me what it looks like to collaborate with one another um, in a way that is in accordance with the revolutionary mothering ethic. And so to the extent that we can, and we're conscious of extricating ourselves from practices of domination and resisting the impulse to compete. And I'm just over here shaking my head because <laughs> I agree with all those things, you know, here we are in our writing group, practicing revolutionary mothering in our interaction of working together while we're writing, you know, this particular essay, you know, this, this article. And so um, it was a definitely a great practice. Um, I know one of the things I am thinking about is once the article is published, how do I take it back to the mothers, right? What type of panel, uh, what type of uh, platform, what kind of activity I can do to, to make sure that they have access, right? Have access of it in a very real way. And I know for me, that was something that was very important as a person who consider herself a scholar activist, how do we make sure that when we create this article that it's not limited to, to, to just the ivory tower? So now these mothers have trusted and trusted us with their sacred word. So how do we take this published piece and then bring it back to them to show them that we were able to um, honor them, right? And not only just honor them and like, oh, we got our publication, we're done, you know, but no, we, we have the publication now, can we share it with you in your space? And so um, these are some of the things I'm thinking about um, as we wait for the publication in the fall of, of 2022. And I just wanna point out that we have a question uh, from uh, Mariel Rollins. Uh, who asks about the notion of romanticizing that we all addressed and what that is pushing back against? And is that a critique from inside of our group or external? Yeah, um, hopefully I stay on long enough to answer this question, but that was just quickly, um, we wanted to make sure that we issued a disclaimer that in our foregrounding Black women's maternal activism, that we are not somehow bolstering a strong, the strong woman, the superwoman trope, that Black women, whenever they encounter grief, they just press on and press through. And so we did not, we weren't, we weren't meaning, um, that, wasn't un, that, that wasn't unintended or that wasn't intended. So we wanted to make sure that we front loaded, that was a part of the front matter of our, of, of our work is that we recognize how this might be construed and this is not what we're doing, that we can you know, hold these things in the same space with one another and not um, you know, reify a really, really problematic and damaging narrative. And I think along with that, we were also very much concerned that as uh, Eve Tuck warns us um, not to produce another damage centered narrative. And so um, we were not really, we're trying to find that balance between not romanticizing um, and, and telling the truth of, of the nature of this maternal mourning, but at the same time, um, really demonstrating um, something beyond the, beyond the blood and gore that we associate with necropolitics. And so that was really taking a strength-based approach and really looking at the sources of, um, from which Black mothers um, who suffer this ill fate uh, call that um, strength, uh, the strength of their ancestors, of the long legacy of Black mothers who have been in the same boat metaphorically. Um, and also even through their epigenetic experience um, as, as children of those who survived the abyss of the boat and the plantation, um, 
uh, in order to find those reasons to continue living and striving. We have another question um, from Dr. Harard, and it, she, she wants to know um, about our process. Can we talk about why we decided to do a, a co-authored um, a piece? And uh, I know, um, I guess when I was working on the piece, um, I, I was starting to think of people and backgrounds and I had through our beautiful group, writing group, and for us, I had read something that Dr. Malonis had did on necropolitics. And I was really, I was really very much so interested in necropolitics and wanting to, to apply it to black mothers. And um, so I asked, you know, I, I just said, hey, can you contribute? You know, what are you thinking about this idea? She said, yes. And um, from, from there, we just, you know, we included more. Right, we we understood. I'm um, gonna say Dr. Jones' background in psychology. Right, you can't talk about these oppressions that Black mothers go through without understanding some form of uh, psychological, without having some form of understanding of of their psychology. Right, and so that's kind of how it it kind of happened. It kind of really happened organically. How each of our backgrounds just kind of merged. Uh, um, merged in this paper to, to, to really provide a holistic picture of, I would say black maternal necropolitics and mothering dead bodies. It, it made sense. Did any one of you all want to talk about the co-authoring process? I think Dr. Malonis is frozen again. Um, I think I, I alluded to that when I talked about what it, um, the process of us mothering this paper um, together. But I would say that for me as, as a burgeoning scholar, as a person um, who is entering into the realm of doctorship, um, it was a very important um, experience in my scholarly development to learn how to work with uh, other scholars uh, within an ethic that um, helps us to um, put the work first and to put our egos second. So yeah, so um, Dr. Malonis, I know <laughs> you're here. If you want to comment on your co-authoring process, I don't know if you if you had anything to say about yeah. that. Um, I just want to say quickly, just as like some wisdom that I've learned that's in response to Dr. Willoughby Herard's question is that it really matters being in proximity with one another. The reason why it was even a thought to put um, to put our talents together to produce this work is because we just spent time getting to know each other, know each other and to, um, to become intimate with each other's ideas. And so forging communities such as this, I think, are can be really vital and generative. And so just really being in proximity with one another is really important. Yeah, and so just to say, I, I definitely in, uh, in, agree uh, with Dr. Malonis on that, because it's not the easiest process, right? We had to we had to learn how to um, to work together, right? To be to be there, to care, to work from an ethics of care, to be intentional, right? And it's a learning process. Um, but I, we managed because we got we, we finished it, <laughs> and it will be pub it, it will be published um, in the fall. So um, that is our time, um, Dr. Jones. I don't know if you wanted to say anything else. Um, I guess just to add to what you said, you know, also learning how to share space and learning how to share voice was very important in our process. Right. Overall, I think we are all very happy with the birth of our paper um, and sharing it with the world and particularly with the mothers who were able to see themselves through our retelling of their process. And I, I just want to say that um, Dr. Uh, Malone said thank you. She wanted everyone to know thank you. And uh, 
Uh, we also have um, just um, someone who said, thank you, Dr. Caesar, Dr. Jones, and Dr. Malonis. This is such a powerful paper and process. Thank you so much for writing and sharing this thoughtful scholarship. I can't wait to read the published piece and continue thinking through what you all have brought forward. And on that note, I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Bye.